So 6.1, we're going to talk about inner products. So what is an inner product? So an inner product is this notation, uv, on a vector space v, is actually a scalar. The inner product is a scalar, and it has the following properties. The first property is uv is equal to vu, so it's commutative, and u and v are in the vector space. Now, remember, they, they could be vectors, but they could also be functions or whatever the parent vector space is. The second property is if we have u plus v added in the first position, well, it can get separated with w staying the same thing. The third property is if we have a scalar inside, just one of them, it can come out as k. It's kind of very similar to the determinant, where you, if you have a scalar in common in one of the rows, it comes out. If it's in two rows, and it comes out as k squared. So obviously, if I had a k here, then it would be k, k squared that came out. The fourth property is if we take the inner product of itself, well, then it has to be greater than or equal to 0. It will equal to 0 only if u is equal to 0. So if all four of these properties hold, then we can consider v an inner product space. So one example is Rn. In Rn, we would have u and v be vectors. And so the inner product of u and v, remember it has to be a scalar, it would be the dot product. So in Rn, the dot product is the most common inner product, but there could be more and you can define your own. So we're gonna define this inner product as two u1, v1, where there are the first components of each of these, plus five u2, v2, where they're the second components of each of those. So let's write that out. And so v is the vector. And so that's what it's defined to be. And we're going to go through the four properties to show that it's an inner product space. So the first property, uv equals vu. So we can just write out both of these and show that they are equal. So we're just literally writing out the definition of what our inner product is. So there's uv. Now let's write out vu. The difference here is since v is first, we put v first. But since these are all scalars, we do know that these are equal. Because the real numbers and the commutative. Okay, our second property. We're going to show... We want to show this. It's the property. And so we're going to start with the left side and we're going to transform it to the right. So here's my left hand side. And let's use the definition of what the inner product is. This is the inner product. Um, let's write out what u plus v is so we can see it clearly. So we just use our normal addition of vectors. So if I add u and v, it's u1 plus v1, you add the components. I add my second components and my w in line with all the others. So it's two times the first components, five times the second components. And then we can distribute. We can distribute the two and the w. So we can do it at the same time. Put that in a little box so it doesn't look like it's equal to that. And then we're going to distribute the 5 and the w. We'll distribute 5w2 at the same time. And that should be a v. My second one right there. Let's rearrange. Let's put these together. And then we'll add these together. So add the blues. And what we have here, it's our definition of our original definition, but it's not uv, it's uw for the first one. It's the inner product of uw. And this is the inner product of vw. And that looks like it is my, 
my right hand side right here. That's what I wanted to show, and I did. Okay, number three, we wanna show, so again, we're gonna use the same process. We're gonna start with the left hand side and transform it to the right. So KU, I'm just gonna use this, and our V, V1, V2. It's two times our first components, so it's two times this component and this component, and then five times our second component. And it looks like we have a K in both of these terms, so we can factor it out. And what's left is just our definition of our inner product of U, V. So it looks like we showed the right-hand side is equal to the left-hand side. And our last one, number four. You can use parentheses or the pointy ones. It doesn't matter. So we want to show it's greater than zero, so let's write it out. Two first components, which will be the same. Five second components, which are the same. So we can square them. And since everything's positive and a square is always positive, that's greater than or equal to zero. It's equal to zero only if the vector v is equal to zero, if each of these are zero. So it does satisfy all four properties. Therefore, it is an inner product space. Okay, let's look at another example. So this inner product is a matrix A times vector U dot product with A times V. And this is called the matrix induced inner product. Let's do an example. So given a matrix A and given the two vectors U and V, we want to find the inner product induced by A. So what we're going to need, we're going to use this formula right here that we just went over. We want to find the dot product of AU dot AV. So first we need to find AU and then we need to find AV. So let's find those first. Multiply those. Dot product. So what we have here is AU is 2, 7. AV is minus 6, 9. We take the dot product of those two, and that's our answer. And that's our answer. Let's look at a different example. So the inner product on the set of continuous functions from 0 to 1, the definite integral of the product of f and g from 0 to 1. And that's definitely a scalar. They all have to be scalars. Let's look at an example. So we just multiply these two and integrate it from 0 to 1. And the answer is minus 5 fourths. So if we have continuous function from minus pi to pi, it's the same thing, but we go from minus pi to pi in our definite integral. And we can have a Fourier inner product. This is a common inner product. I'm going to find. And in order to calculate this one, since this is a product, we are going to use product of sum since they're different angles. The u sub won't work. So here's the formula, product of sum that we need. So using that formula, pull the half out here. So the first one, we add the angles. 
the second one, we subtract the angles 2x minus 3x. You can pull this out because it's an odd function. Integrate. So 5 pi and pi, these negatives can disappear because these are even functions. But they are right here in this position. This is minus 1, 0. So that's my cosine of 5 pi and pi. 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi, same position, which is negative 1. Here we'll have to distribute. Those cancel, those cancel, and I get zero. Hopefully you worked it out on your own, paused it and worked it out, and got zero too. So let me write out what I just said about odd functions and even functions. Should be a review from algebra. If you plug in a negative and it's an odd function, that negative factors out to the front. And if it's an even function, that negative just disappears, like that cosine is even and sine is odd. So here's a note that's going to be very helpful in the coming up weeks. So if we're integrating an odd function from minus a to a, these values have to be the same. So if we want to sketch it, you can think of y equals x to the third, for example. All odd functions are going to be symmetric about the origin. And so if I integrate from a to minus a, this space here and this space here are the same. But since one's positive and one's negative, it's the net area is going to be 0. So the integral from minus a to a will be 0 for an odd function only. Even function you can double if it's from minus a to a. So quick proof of this also. So if we're integrating an odd function, the integral of that odd function is going to be an even function. So for powers or adding one, it's going to change. It's true for even for sine and cosine. And it's going to be from minus a to a. And since f is even, capital F, that negative can disappear. And I get 0. So further proof that the integral of an odd function is 0. So what can I do with that? Let's go back up to that last problem. Bring it back down here. When we're integrating this, sine of x is odd. Cosine of x is even. So what do you think a product of an odd times an even is? Well, it's going to be odd. The way I think about this is I think I have, think about it having an odd number of negatives, since it is about negatives, and an even number of negatives. And then when I times an odd number of negatives times an even number of negatives, I'm going to have an odd number of negatives. And again, you can just think of it that way. It works every time. If I have an odd function times an odd function, that will be an even function. And that's all I have to do because of this. Okay, that's it for today. The second video on this section will be about magnitude. Have a good day.